we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 this morning. Starting in verse 57, we'll have it up on the screen. I encourage you to get your Bibles out as well, though, as we look at God's word together. It says in verse 57, Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her and the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he spoke, a bl- and he spoke blessing God. And fear came upon all the neighbors and all these things were talked about throughout the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And the father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all those who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us, that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways and to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. Because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in the spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Father, I pray that as we look at this text in more detail, I ask, Father, that your spirit would fill me to be able to speak, just as it filled Zechariah, in order to speak them. And uh, I pray, Lord, that your spirit, uh, which is alive and well, and all of your people here at Marcel, that it would just uh, work wonders in terms of bringing this passage and this text to light here for us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know about you. I could be wrong. Mara tells me I'm wrong once in a while, maybe a lot of times. But uh, I've noticed, have you noticed, that there doesn't seem to be as many Christmas lights around. Uh, you know, maybe it's because I never leave the house at 4.30, <laughs> so and I never see it. But I really think it's true. There's not as many Christmas lights when you drive around. You know, used to be in Deer River, you'd see a house with decked out and, and the nativity scene in the in the uh, uh, the yard and maybe even a Santa Claus and reindeer and snowman or whatever else in town. It just seems to me kind of uh, like it's rather dark in town when I'm driving around and seeing it. I didn't go to Bentleyville. I didn't see that show, but maybe if you did that, you saw your fair share of lights there and... And maybe, as I said, I just don't get out enough. But, you know, winter without lights is really dark. As a matter of fact, next week, uh, Tuesday, least favorite day of the year, darkest day of the year. Almost twice as much darkness in that day as there is light. But I always like December 22nd because there's a sign of hope that light is coming. It's going to be better in a month from now. There's going to be more daylight. And I bring that up because when I look at this story in Zechariah, I just think to myself, here's a guy that has been living in the dark for about nine months. Uh, he had eyesight, but he didn't have much else. He was pretty trapped in his own world here. And do you remember that story that we looked at a couple of weeks ago that brought us to the point here today? Zechariah was in the temple. That was what we looked at in chapter 1, the first part of it. Uh, he was in the temple, and he was uh, doing what the priest only got once in a lifetime shot to do, which is to burn incense on the altar. And I was chosen by lot, kind of by chance, so to speak, but we know that the Lord had actually opened up this opportunity for him. And so he went in to burn incense in the temple, and he saw the angel Gabriel standing at the right side of the incense altar. 
And uh, what Zechariah was told is that his prayer had been answered. His prayer for what? Prayer for a baby, probably, among other things. Uh, prayer for a son. Because he's a very old man, his wife was way past the age of childbearing, and they had wanted a child, but they were unable to conceive. And so now the angel tells him that, yeah, you're going to have that baby. And, and, and this baby is going to be named John, and he's going to be a really big deal in God's plan. And yet, what did Zechariah do? Praise God. Yes, I won. I won the lottery. Here it is. God has blessed me here. He didn't. He, he he's kind of responds with disbelief. How shall I know this to be true, he says. There's a, there's, a, there's a tinge of doubt in his voice. How can I possibly know? And we looked at that in that first week, and, and I don't know exactly why he didn't believe. Uh, one thought is, is maybe he had become so accustomed to not seeing God answer his prayers that he had started to believe that maybe God doesn't do that kind of stuff. Or maybe he had been probably 45, 50 years praying for a child and God never answering. He had struggled with so much disappointment that he just didn't want to put any possibility of hope anymore in what God, how God might answer their prayers. Well, at any rate, what ended up happening is the angel said, because you did not believe, because you disbelieved, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have a divine timeout for a while. Uh, it says that he was uh, going to be stuck in silence and unable to speak. And it, it's probably from what we discern from the passage we just read, because they're making signs to him. It's probably not just that he was unable to speak. It's probably also he was unable to hear. And so he was trapped for these nine months uh, to think about what the Lord was doing in his life and think about the, what God had promised. And uh, he was trapped in this kind of very dark, quiet world. And God was going to be merciful to him. You're going to have the baby in nine months. You doubt it, but I'm still going to bless you. But at the same time, you're going to think about it for a while, about the promise that God had made. And so I imagine if... Uh, you lived in that day and age that if you lived without the ability to speak and without the ability to hear, think about how small your world becomes all of a sudden, wouldn't it? I mean, there was no closed captioning on television in those days, so you couldn't, couldn't turn on the TV and see that. You couldn't turn on the TV at all. There was no TVs. There was no American Sign Language that he could whip up with Elizabeth. You know, they had to figure it out as they go. You know, it was a largely kind of non literate type of a culture and so it wasn't like he could just write everything out it was a complicated process he was being trapped in a very dark and quiet place I once knew a gal that had a very major major stroke and um, she got out of surgery they didn't know that she had a stroke but all of a sudden when she started to come to and and they realized she couldn't speak she would open her mouth and she'd try to say something and she couldn't say it and, and it was a very alarming moment as as you know they get out these sheets of paper with pictures on it you know you can point to the picture as if you know there's enough pictures to tell us what she wanted to say or there was letters on a page you got to spell out what you want to say it was extremely frustrating for her and for everyone for her husband as well a very difficult moment and i imagine that's how zachariah would have felt you know trapped trapped for nine months Charades is a fun game, not for nine months, you know. It's it, it really, you could think clearly in your brain. You could think what you wanted to communicate. You could think about stuff, but you couldn't communicate it to other people in any sort of real way. And so uh, I'm sure Zachariah did a lot of thinking in that silence, and he would, first thing he thought about was, you know, Elizabeth is putting on a few pounds here, maybe, you know. No, she is pregnant, just like Gabriel had said. You know, the baby bump at five months is getting pretty big here, and and that's a pretty amazing thing. And then he sees Mary at the sixth month come and visit, and he can only observe and see. He can't hear uh, what's going on. You know, the gals are getting excited with each other, and he finally figures out as they start pointing at their bellies that, oh, Mary's pregnant too. This is getting really weird. And, and uh uh, then I, I imagine just three months after Mary leaves, or, or just after Mary leaves, actually, uh, Elizabeth goes into labor pain. She has a child, and then the next thing Zachariah knows is the midwife is sticking a, a baby son into a, an old man's arms. And, and all of a sudden, he realizes that everything God had promised, it's here. I had doubted this, this moment, and here it is. And then eight days later, it says in that text, uh, there was the circumcision. There was a family gathering, a friends gathering, a neighborhood gathering. 
They seem to normally, in other places in the Old Testament, name the child immediately at birth, but was this the time in which they formally named the child, gave the name that they were going to formally announce it as to the rest of the community? I don't know. But it says here that uh, they, they were going to circumcise the child. They had all the family and friends there, and then what they say? The time came to announce the name, and they told Elizabeth, you should pick Zechariah. Not a common thing, by the way. Normally, the, the, the son is not named after the father in Jewish culture, maybe after a grandfather, but, you know, Zechariah is old enough to be grandpa to this kid anyway. So maybe Zechariah would be an appropriate name, they say. As a matter of fact, it sounds like the way it's worded in uh, uh, this text here that, that um, they kind of just decided, you know. Maybe Elizabeth was kind of out of it. I don't know. She had a baby, so she had to be tired out by this whole thing. And, and, and she was having some sleepless nights at kind of a retirement age. So maybe they thought, you know, uh, they would call him Zachariah or, yeah, after his father. But she says something. She says, no, no. Indeed, he should be called John. Uh, not a good name. There's nobody in your family named John. That's a stupid name. It's a good name. But it's a stupid idea, they're saying to her. That, 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 that's not good. You got a name of Zachariah. I mean, give the old man some joy that he has a son named after him. And so they asked Zachariah what he thought. And, and notice what Zachariah did. They motioned to him. You know, I don't know how they motioned. You know, baby, name. What do you want the name? Did they put a name tag and like fill it in? What do you want, Zach? And uh, he gets out his iPad, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Verse 53, a writing tablet, which was probably actually a wooden board that had wax on the top, and he would scribe into that, uh, kind of a, kind of a, like a whiteboard of sorts of ancient days, and he wrote in, his name is John. And they're floored. Him and Elizabeth didn't have this conversation because he couldn't hear what she was saying, and he couldn't communicate to her, and, and how did they get this across? And why would he name him John? But notice they're even more floored what happens in verse 64. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he spoke. They're blessing God, praising God. And it says fear came upon their neighbors. This was the moment in which Zechariah's obedience demonstrated his faith. I'm all in, Lord. I believe it. I doubt it. And God had mercy upon him in that moment. God had mercy upon him his whole life. You're going to have the child even though you doubt, just like we read in Jude this morning, have mercy on those who doubt. God was merciful to Zechariah who was doubting and fulfilled it. And then when it says he praised God, that's when it goes into verse 67 where he tells us the content of what he prophesied by being filled with the Spirit and praised God for. And, and I think this song, as it's sometimes referred to, it's referred to as the Benedictus. We saw last week that Mary's song is called the Magnificat in church history because of the first word in the Latin translation. This is called the Benedictus because it's the first word in the Latin translation, meaning blessed. A and in this song, we see three pictures in here of salvation that are really important for us to get. These are spirit-inspired pictures of salvation. These are the kind of things that uh, we need because, see, if we don't have God's view of salvation, we make salvation all about us. That God's salvation is when he makes us prosper in life. So that's some versions of people's idea of God's salvation. Or, or God's salvation, uh, we need it because we want to be successful in life or we want to have a good life or we want God to fix all of our problems and give us relief. And that's not exactly what God's salvation is really all about. And he tells us three pictures here that I want us to look at. And the first is, is that um, we are captives who need God's deliverance. You see that in verses 68 through 75, the first chunk of this prophecy. It, it says in verse 68 that, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Notice that word visited. I mean, uh, uh, that's not coffee and donuts, like if you were to stop by and visit me or visit somebody else. This is God showed up. This is biblically rich language to say that God breaks into the, the situation, that breaks into the historical timeline, and he does something amazing. God visited his people. He provides them, it says in 68, redemption. Redemption is the price that's paid to uh, set someone free who's in captivity. 
And so the way in which God shows up is he's, he's providing freedom for the people who are captives. It says in verse 69 that he raised up a, a horn of salvation. This is referring to Jesus. And, and the horn of salvation is not the kind you beep on your car. It, it's, it's the animal that had horns on it. And, and often that's a symbol of their strength, their power. But some of you guys have a antler racks on the, on the, in your house somewhere. Why? You're more powerful than that deer even, right? You, you killed it, and you're going to be your trophy. You're going to show it off. Jesus is the horn of God's salvation. He is the power, the strength. He is the one from the house of David that is going to be that one who brings salvation. And, and it says there in verse 74 that the very purpose of setting us free is so that we may serve without fear in holiness, serve the Lord without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. See, what he's saying here is that salvation, one picture of it is is that we're captives and we need freedom. Jesus sets us free from ourselves, from sin, from Satan, and from everything else. There's something in our sin nature that often says, but I'm not really a slave. As a matter of fact, uh, when Jesus in John chapter 8 said that uh, if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed, what did the Pharisees' first gut instinct say? We're not slaves to anyone. We've never been slaves to anyone. Have you looked at the Roman soldiers running around the country? I think you're slaves in a physical sense. But I think even deep down inside, they're slaves through the sense of sin, through the sense of their the sin that dominates their lives. We can deny it too, right? That we're slaves. A society that loses hope often turns to momentary pleasures in order to distract us, to keep our minds off of what's going on. And I think we have a lot of captivity in our world. Sometimes we call them technically addictions, but it's enslavement to a certain thing in our lives so that it controls us. Uh, Maybe to lust that's destroying a marriage. Maybe to alcohol, which is is there to make us try to forget the things we don't want to think about in life. It it might be addiction to outrage. I I think we've got a lot of addiction to outrage going on in the world right now. That we we love every news cycle that comes on. Ah, I can be mad again, and I can justify it. We have addiction to fear. We're afraid to take your pick. COVID, changes to culture, government overreach, the future in general. Will this pandemic ever end? This sort of a thing. We're enslaved to a thousand different things, and we can be enslaved to a thousand more different things. And Jesus, though, doesn't want us to be slaves to those things. He wants us to be slaves of him, who's a good master, who gives us everything we would ever imagine. Jesus came to set us free. That doesn't happen immediately, instantly, the moment you receive Christ as your Savior. Some things does. You hear some Christians that they have certain things in their life, the moment they get saved, they're just immediately set free from that thing and they never go back. Most of the time, God gives us miracles one at a time, choice after choice through the power of the Holy Spirit as he indwells us and we learn to walk with him. But that's just as much freedom as anything else. The second picture, though, is that we're also debtors who need to have our debt canceled before God. Notice verse 76. Zechariah here says, uh, by the Spirit of God, he says, and you, child. See, before he's talking about Jesus, but now he's, I, I picture him holding John, Johnny B., Johnny the Baptist here in his arms. And he says, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. Uh, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. See, if the president shows up in town, is there a little bit of prep work that goes on before he shows up? He doesn't just land the plane and pop out, right? I mean, there's weeks of preparation, weeks of security measures, weeks of preparing the people for what you're about to see. When Jesus shows up in town, John the Baptist had the job of setting the path straight, preparing the way making sure that everybody was ready to hear what he had to say. And John, of course, did that. He did that by calling people to repentance. Repentance is that turning around in life, that change of mind leading to a change of action, to turn around from living life on our terms, in our way, doing it with our own thinking and power, and turning to God and saying, I'm turning to you as the one who will guide my life. I'm turning to you who alone can provide salvation. And and it says in the end of verse 77 that this... uh, 
forgiveness of sins would be, uh, uh, it, it would be the result of this turning around. When they turn to God and receive his salvation, there would be the forgiveness of sins. Literally, that word forgiveness can mean the canceling of a debt, whether literal debt, money, or spiritual debt, in our case, as debt before God. And, and did you know that you're, you and I are in debt if God hasn't forgiven us? And I think this is where sometimes gospel presentations get off. I remember hearing a lot of gospel presentations, people telling us the good news about Jesus. I remember a lot of times they never told me there was a problem, so I didn't know why I needed a solution. They told me there's a lot of good things. It will give you happiness, joy, meaning in your life. It's all true, all true. But the good news comes after the bad news. And the bad news is, is I've sinned against a holy God and I have a debt before him because I have lived life on my terms. And let's be honest, I like to think of myself as just a person that makes a few mistakes and maybe blown it a few times and stumbled and tripped. But the reality is, is it's been a little darker than that. I've kind of said to God, maybe literally, uh, at least implicitly, I want life like I want it. And I don't care what you say. I want to live it in the way I want to live it. And I don't care, God, if you tell me that's wrong. And the reality is, isn't it, that um, even our own standards, we never live up to them. Some of us, how many of you are still following your New Year's resolution from last January? You had the standard in your own mind of what it is you're going to do. Probably most of us about second, third week of January is that, eh, maybe not, maybe not. Maybe that was a bad idea when I, when I was feeling good. Well, the good news is, is that Jesus paid the debt. He paid it all. John the Baptist, when the first time he saw Jesus walking through in a public setting, he pointed to his disciples and he's pointed to Jesus. In John chapter 1, 29, he said, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He knew that Jesus' destiny was to be the sacrifice for sins. Somehow, probably speaking words beyond even he knew, but Jesus paid it all. He paid the price. He died in our place. He took the punishment and the debt that my sins deserved and willingly suffered in my place. And why did God do it? Notice that uh, wording in verse 78, because of the tender mercy of our God. More literally, it's the bowels of mercy. Did you know that God has bowels of mercy? Did you know God has bowels for that matter? That, that's this is enlightening. I don't think literally speaking, he's speaking in human kind of terms we can grasp, but in the Jewish language, um, we speak of feelings coming from the heart, but in the Jewish language, it's the stomach. Makes sense to me. When I'm worried, where do I feel it? In my stomach. When I have joy, where do I feel it? In my stomach. I feel butterflies in my stomach, you might say. And it says here that God has in his stomach a sense of mercy for, for us. He, he wants us to experience his salvation. He loves us that much. And then the last picture is in verses 78 through 79, which shows us that in darkness, that we are in darkness that needs God's new day. Notice verse 78, it says, Because of the tender mercies of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Salvation frequently in the Bible is spoken of as light or sunrise. It's like a sunrise after a long, cold, dark night. Ever been camping on a cold winter night? You look forward to the sunrise, don't you? I remember a buddy of mine back in, I don't know, eons ago, I guess now, we went to Utah in, in the spring break in March. Before we got to Utah, where we were going to hike, there was 18 inches of snow. So that first night, we put our tent on top of that 18 inches of snow, and we were not prepared for that cold that radiated through us all night long, hearing coyotes outside, hearing strange animal noises and freezing to death, I thought, I cannot wait to see the sun. Just show me the sun, Lord. If you give me one more day, I will serve you the rest of my life. This is where I gave my life to Christ, right there. No, I'm just kidding. It really wasn't. But, uh, but you know what that's like. It's like hope again. Maybe you've gone through a very difficult time in your life. Night can be the really the hardest times when it's dark. And we shed a lot of tears in those moments. You just look forward to saying, I know it'll feel better when I can see the sun again, but right now it doesn't. That's a great picture of what salvation is. It's like a new day, a new dawn. 
salvation is often again spoken of as light uh, this time of year we often quote uh, Isaiah 9 2 people in darkness have seen a great light and of course that great light is the Savior of the world Jesus Christ but one other passage of scripture if you want to turn it there you can is Colossians chapter 1 where it speaks of what Jesus has done for us through his son Jesus Christ and it says in Colossians 1 verse 13 he meaning Jesus has delivered us well it sounds like releasing those who are captives delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see all three of those things there? Victory, forgiveness, and light. See, God's salvation through Jesus Christ is a victory, it's a canceled debt of sin, and it's a new day. And I would just ask you, have you experienced that? Have you experienced that salvation, that light, that forgiveness of sin, that canceled debt? I know many, many, many of you have, and that is absolutely wonderful. Uh, have you personally trusted in Christ, though? Have you gotten to the point where you could do like Mary did when she referred to uh, um, Jesus? She, she referred to him as my Savior, not a Savior, as my Savior. Have you, have you gotten to that place in your life? It's easy to talk about a Savior. How about my Savior? He's touched me. He's changed me. And just one last thought. Uh, I noticed something in this passage of scripture um, in verse 66. I'm sorry, 65, back in Luke 1. That I found it interesting that when Zechariah's mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and he spoke blessing God, and it says that fear came upon all their neighbors. Now, you might brush that off and say, well, that's in the biblical sense of fear, awe. I might have gotten there, but I have my suspicions that may not have been the initial fear that they were experiencing. Because for a lot of people, that is their initial hearing of God is filled with a lot of fear. A lot of fear when they hear a Christian say, you know, I was praying about that and the Lord answered my prayer. There's fear. Uh, when other non-Christians hear a Christian say, you know, I was really discouraged and the Lord led me directly in my quiet time to this passage, that spoke to me tremendously this morning. There's fear. When God breaks into somebody's life and does something dramatic, whether you, they go to the doctor and the, uh, the, the, the scan is clear or they have an answer to prayer beyond uh, anything we could explain in this life, there's a lot of times for unbelievers initial response of fear and the reason is, is because it makes it so real that God is real. And if God is real, then is he here for my good or is he here to judge? Am I under the judgment of God? It's kind of the, the implicit question that a lot of people feel when they first hear about how God uh, interacts in the world in a way. But for that, we need to be reminded of that we have a God who has that tender mercy towards us. Probably the most famous verse in the Bible, of course, is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But it's verse 17 that's just as important to keep into that context, which says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. We don't need to fear that God's coming near us in Jesus Christ is a bad thing can fear, feel and know that Jesus Christ coming into the world, he's offering salvation. He offers it to everyone who will trust him personally, who will believe. So if you haven't done that, remember that this is a salvation is a victory. It's a canceled debt. It's a new day. Receive it today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your graciousness to us. Thank you for your tender mercies, Father. I pray and ask, Lord, for all of us here today, whether we have uh, experienced that many years ago or just considering or on the edge of experiencing it and seeking that out today, I pray, Father, that you would just guide each of us to a, a deep appreciation of your son, salvation in your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray this, Father, so that you will uh, work in people's hearts and lives 
we've gotten kind of maybe stale to the reality of God in our lives like Zechariah had been before this whole event, I pray that we would experience you afresh. And if, Father, we are sitting in fear, I pray that we would know we can turn to you because you didn't send your son to condemn, but to save. Thank you for the scenes in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd get out your communion cups.